everyone, this is a meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Today is March 26, 2024. It is 4 p.m. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. This Aye. meeting is being audio and video recorded. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, gentlemen, we got a couple of executive sessions first on the agenda. The first one is executive session on the general law, chapter 30A, subsection 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation time cards. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body, and the chair so declares, and the board will return to public session at the conclusion of the executive session. The second one is an executive session on the general law, chapter 30A, subsection 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, pending litigation, MCAD. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body, and the chair so declares the board will return to public session at the conclusion of executive session. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Roll call vote, Mr. Inkley? Yes. Mr. Lona. Yes. And I am a yes. We are now in executive session. Is there a motion to reconvene? Open session. Roll call vote. Mr. Hinckley? Yes. Mr. Lona? Yes. And I am a yes. We are now in open session. Gentlemen, I'm going to go out of order. We have Kevin McHugh here from Conoco, um, an associate Tucker, here to do a small um, presentation of our MS, the town's MS4 permitting, the first of its kind. Um, so, Mr. McHugh, I'll turn it over to you and you can jump right in and right. give us an update on what's been going on with the town's MS4 permitting process. I know a lot of people at home, uh, you know, we talked about it numerous times. I know I've talked about it numerous times um, with the folks, but we've never had the opportunity to have you in to give an update on what it means for the town to have an MS4 permit. Um, and you'll go through some demonstration, I'm sure, to show us some outfalls, as I can see on the screen. So the floor is yours. Good to go. All right, thank you. Good, thanks, everyone. So, again, I'm Kevin McHugh with Conoco. This is Tucker Lucent, also from Conoco. So appreciate you having us in. Um, so we've pulled together a quick presentation to give, you know, to give everyone an idea of sort of the work that we've been doing and some of the things that we're planning to do over the next few months just to keep checking off the boxes for compliance. Um, as we mentioned before, you know, this MS4 program started actually back in 2003. Um, the permit was extended in 2016 and became effective in 2017. And it just keeps building on itself with requirements that most of the cities and towns of Massachusetts have to comply with. But again, it's all related to stormwater, stormwater quality. And so we're just helping to move the town forward to stay, to be in compliance and stay in compliance. So just give you an idea of some of the things. Just a real quick overview. Um, the whole MS4 permit is really based around the six minimum control measures, which we have listed here. So public education and outreach, public participation. Uh, this is discharge detection elimination, which is really the biggest part of the whole permit itself with the requirements. Uh, management of construction site runoff, management of post-construction site runoff, which is essentially new development and redevelopment projects. And then the last one is good housekeeping and municipal operations. So where we kind of started off with the town is trying to help you to address the public education uh, outreach and the participation portion of, portion of it. And you may have seen, I, I know um, select boards probably seen throughout some of the, the towns, the public buildings, we've developed some brochures and some educational materials um, that for people to help them understand the importance of stormwater, what they can do to help keep the stormwater runoff clean, help to protect surface water bodies and groundwater also. So we have to produce, according to the permit, the very specific requirements of the, the public education information to put together and the audiences that you target. So I won't go into the details of all of those, but every quarter we need to produce new material and that's what we're gonna to continue to do for the town. So we get started off uh, last fall, I guess it actually was next year, to pull this information together. We put a lot of broad information in to try to get you caught up, to get you going on some of the educational materials, but we're gonna to start to keep uh, continuing to produce those, be different target audiences, different messages. Um, one of the things we'd like to do is to be able to get some of this information up on the town's website, I think the town has a Facebook page just to get it electronically too so people sure. can see it. Sure. And that also helps with EPA. If, if EPA does want to take a look at what you're doing, they can just jump on the town's website. They'll see it right there. So yep. that'll help them to know that you know, the town's moving forward with that. But we've been moving along with that. So you're in pretty good shape with the public education portion of it. 
Um, so this is just an idea. It's, it, a, a lot of what we're doing just best management practices. So this, this is an example of one of the public education informational uh, documents that we pulled together. But again, I think they're in town hall. I believe uh, Mr. Hannon, when he was here, he helped to distribute them. So I think they're in town hall in the library. So they should are. see those, those yep. paper copies. Again, we'd like to go electronic if we could, just to help broaden um, the distribution. Now here is the part that I'm going to hand over to Tucker, because this is what he did. But as I mentioned, the illicit discharge detection elimination is the biggest portion of this. Um, big pieces of it are outfall mapping, outfall inspections, wet weather outfall sampling, and that's what Tucker's been running through. And he's actually pulled together some GIS mapping that um, at the end of this project we'll have available for the town. She'll be able to access for this. But Tucker can give you sort of an example of, of where we are so far with this. All right. So you'll see here there's a map um, of the town of Cushion. Um, and here we have a bunch of um, you know, discharges, catch basins, and manholes associated with the stormwater drainage system um, mapped. Um, so you can zoom in here. Um, you see um, this map was put together by the Buzzards Bay Stormwater Collaborative. Um, it's been uh, updated as recently as October 2023. Um, and we've been using this mapping for all of our dry weather and wet weather inspections that we've been doing. <coughs> Um, this information here also includes information on um, the MS4 regulatory status for all these outfalls. So if you look at this map here, um, whether or not an outfall is regulated underneath the permit to be monitored is based on whether it's located within the EPA designated urbanized area. So you can see that urbanized area here marked in red. And all these outfalls that are marked by yellow circles are the cushion outfalls that are regulated for, you know, uh, to be monitored underneath this permit. Hmm. So that's what we've been working on. So if you go down here to the dry weather outfall inspections, we assessed 109 of these outfalls um, that were in the maps above. Um, we were able to locate 73 of them. A number of them were inaccessible or deemed not an outfall based on uh, the work that the stormwater uh, collaborative had done before. Um, we collected data on the construction of the outfalls, the condition of the outfalls, and we looked for any indications of an illicit discharge. Um, so we completed all that dry weather inspection um, this past fall. So everything's complete as far as that's concerned. Um, we also assessed viability for wet weather sampling in any of these outfalls. Um, so here you can see an example of an outfall uh, we found uh, with a tree growing around it. Um, so we started doing the wet weather inspections this past fall and into the winter. Um, we assessed a total of 70 outfalls. Um, part of that assessment is detecting whether or not there's flow. So when we say wet weather inspections, what we mean is if there was a tenth of an inch of rain in the last 24 hours. Um, so for 54 of the outfalls we inspected, we had flow coming out of the uh, pipes and we collected water samples and we did field analysis for different water chemistry um, characteristics, pH, temperature, conductivity, looked for chlorine and surfactants, um, you know, made note of the color turbidity of the uh, outflow discharge. Um, and we've been keeping all that information in tables and also in GIS databases for you guys, which would be available when we're all complete with our inspections. And um, at this time, we've finished inspecting all the outfalls that we uh, set out to inspect uh, at the beginning of this winter. <coughs> so dry weather and wet weather are complete. Yep. Excellent. Yep. So we are all set with uh, dry weather, dry weather inspections and wet weather inspections at this time. Um, just some photos of you know, various discharges that we found in the field, um, different stormwater manholes. Um, so this is you know, our, our map of our survey results. So we collected everything in the field um, using ArcGIS Survey123. Um, so you can see here, you know, we can click on an outfall ID and hmm. I can pull up you know, all the information from the survey, hmm. um, which includes you know, our field screening results, how much rainfall we had when we inspected it, um, what we submitted for analysis for, um, and including photos in the survey. So all that stuff is stored right now in this database. Just scroll through a couple of these here. This one was collected from a catch basin because the man or the outfall was inaccessible. Um, so yeah, anyways, this is what we've been working on and these are the survey results. Um, and here's some examples for you know, some of the data that we've collected. So when we go in field screen, if we find screening results that are indicative of, you know, uh, ammonia that's too high, when we submit that for laboratory analysis. So 
on the right here you'll see laboratory analytical results and on the left here you'll see um, you know our field screening results uh, we also submit the samples for bacteria analysis which is shown here so as of now we are done with the wet weather inspections we have all of our data in um, so with that I will leave this and let Kevin you have know. a parameter when you look at this stuff for the all yep. false do you have a parameter that you work within with like a acceptable allowances so you have a bunch of different categories, right? Ammonia field screening. So let's just use the first one that you have on there. It says 2.0 on that mm -hmm. outfall, right? Yep. Is there a parameter that you look that you have to work within, say, zero to five, and that one's 2.0? Is if it falls outside of the five, is that like a trigger where you would continue further investigation, or you know, there's got to be some something that you work off of to say. That outfall is a problem. We need to address that outfall. So, as far as our field screening goes, um, you can see here, for for example, the 2.0. So, the EPA has uh, established benchmarks. So, if during our field screening, we identify numbers that are in excess of a certain amount. So, for ammonia, it's 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. So, when we go out and we do our field screening tests and we get two, um, that you know says, okay, we're above the benchmark. We need to now submit this water for laboratory analysis, um, which is why you'll see for that first outfall, we have an ammonia result here. Um, but for the one below it, where we had a field training result of zero, we did not submit that sample. To lab. Right, it was right. not required to do that because we didn't find any ammonia in the water sample. And then for the laboratory results, um, is there anything you want to add for that? Yeah, so in, in the, there's, um, so EPA, I think, we may have talked about this a little bit before. So EPA does have some protocols in for what we do from here. So one of the things you look at is obviously um, the bacteria analysis is important. Unfortunately, bacteria, it doesn't designate whether it's a human bacteria or generated by an animal. So that and some of these numbers will look excessively high, but that may not mean anything because it could be the result of animal waste. So, but it, but it is something you need to take a look at. One of the, th or a couple of the things that we really will look at and focus on is concentrations of surfactants. So if you get a high level of surfactants, I think it's 0.25 is the trigger. I have to go back and look. I think it's 0.25 milligrams per liter of surfactants. That's an indication that it could be soaps in the stormwater, which you shouldn't have soaps, obviously, in your stormwater. So that's an indication that somewhere there's probably an illicit connection. Another one is a ratio of phosphorus and ammonia. And if you go, tr if, if that ratio is over a certain number, I think that's also 0.25 milligrams per liter. That's another indication that it's not a stormwater flow, but there could be something sanitary or some other type of illicit connection tied in. So that's the next part of this that we're going to go through, is go through this data now, see any of these outfalls that trigger that, so that the reference numbers that EPA has set up, and from there, then we'll start working upstream. And first thing we'll do is just look at the GIS mapping and see what is upstream. You know, do we have you know, a large pond upstream or what's contributing? From there, we move, start looking at opening manholes and going upstream, seeing if you have a wet weather flow in that manhole. Are there some first visible uh, indications that there could be a legal co an illicit connection, something like toilet paper in a, man in a stormwater manhole, if you have strange odors, a sheen, but we'd also collect samples from there. And we basically work your way upstream from manhole to manhole until you get the results that are under that trigger. Then you know you have your downstream manhole that has high numbers, your upstream manhole has low numbers, you know there's something coming in in between. Right. And that's where right. we, we isolate that area. Right, right. So this is the next thing we're looking at is, okay, what numbers do we have here and where do we need to go from here and track upstream? Got it. So that would be the next field work that we work on doing. Question for you. So presumably all this infrastructure, this infrastructure was put in place like years and years ago. <laughs> so in your opinion, do we, is the infrastructure that we have in place sufficient for the town i mean there's been when this infrastructure was put in place the town probably wasn't as built out as right. it is now right are we keeping up with what we need to be doing or should there be you know should we be adding to what we currently have or well honest, honestly from an in infrastructure standpoint we're really not looking at that because that's a that's a whole drainage issue so that's a completely different thing okay. you know looking at sub catchments and amount of flow you have and can you, you know, it, that becomes i think you're asking more about like a flooding type issue well, just in general, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm learning sure. from the job here, right? So I just see, you know, all these different streets that have infrastructure. Like, all right, what was the determination? Why, why there versus not somewhere else in town? And are there, you know, do we, 
Are there something that we need to look at more critically versus, you know, instead of what we currently have, but do we need to be looking to, to expand? Yeah, and and there's, there's two type of things really to look at overall for the town, for the overall stormwater system of the town. Mm -hmm. There's your stormwater quality. So you could look at, is our system sufficient to be able to, to, to manage stormwater quality, to take care of the quality that we have? Do we need to add something in? And, and this is something that we'll be evaluating actually as we go further is, can we add best management practices into specific outfalls or segments of your storm drain system to help to treat stormwater mm -hmm. if you see you have a stormwater issue? So that's another phase of this down the road that we'll take a look at. And then there's also, from a, a quantity standpoint, is your stormwater system sufficient to manage the stormwater that gets collected? And so that's a bigger question because that looks at do we need to add drainage systems, yeah. do we need larger pipes? And that really comes down to do you have flooding? Yeah. Do you have flooding in portions of the town that you would need to address? Yeah, I think we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. to, to put it simply, this part right now is seeing if anything is getting into the existing system mm -hmm. that shouldn't be and how do we eliminate it? Right. Yeah, this is a stormwater quality yeah. permit. Okay. But yeah, there, there's those two different things really to need to look at, two kind of separate things. Um, so jump to the next one, management of construction. I'm sorry, is there any more questions? Is, is that our town? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen <laughs> some, I've seen <laughs> some <laughs> nasty areas, but that one looks really bad. And I thought that was a picture of somewhere in town. I'm like, oh boy, this ain't good. No, I wouldn't do that to you. So manage a construction site runoff and management of post-construction site runoff. So the big part of this, and I know everyone here has been involved with this, is your stormwater bylaw and regulations. So we've been helping this town to upgrade the stormwater bylaw that you have. And for the last couple of years, we've been um, developing draft versions of the stormwater bylaw. I think the most recent one we sent over was um, I think it was this month, March, March of this yeah. year. So that's sort of under review within the town. Um, there's been a couple of components in this last version that we've sent around that still need to be, we'd like to have looked at, for just for confirmation. Um, one of them, one of the most, one of the more important things that we, that we had added in is language into the bylaw to sort of protect the town from a large developer coming in, buying a large parcel of land, and then subdividing that land to be able to skirt the stormwater bylaw requirements. Like right now your stormwater bylaw gets triggered if you're disturbing more than 40,000 square feet of land. So the worry would be um, someone coming in, buying a couple of acres of land, and then saying, we're going to subdivide this, and now it's each lot is less than 40,000 square feet, so therefore we don't have to comply with the stormwater bylaw. Mm -hmm. So we've added some language in there, and we just recommended that um, town council take a look at it to make sure the language makes sense. Um, where we've got this language is from the state's recommended a low impact development bylaw. So it's, it's state language that they have recommended. Um, honestly, it's in legalese, so it isn't very clear for people to read. So we'd like to have the town's council look at it, just make sure it makes sense. But it is similar language to what most other communities have and they have in their bylaw. Is that the section 3 to b Yes. Article 3? Yeah, yeah. Article 3. I'm sorry. Yeah. Article 3 yeah, it's Article 2B. 3. Yes. Yeah. So it, it's, I think it's an important thing to take a look at. Um, one of the other questions or comments that came up on an earlier version was uh, who is the designated authority? And I believe right now it's, it's been the Conservation Commission and I think it still is the Conservation Commission. I think that's the intent. It is. Um, the Planning Board technically, by the old bylaw, is the Stormwater Authority. In okay. this one, the definition of Stormwater Authority changes that to Conservation Commission. Okay. And also I think that makes sense. Yeah. Is to have the Conservation Commission yeah, because it's simple public hearings and it's a lot of what this stormwater bylaw is built around is related to the Wetlands Protection Act anyway. So they're very familiar with it. Right. But uh, some of the language that we have in there that I think is important is the Conservation Commission in the bylaw also has the ability to establish or to set a, 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 an agent so that they can appoint somebody in town to help them with the requirements that they have to meet for the bylaw. So for example, if you know it's a big construction site and you think you want to get input from DPW, they could designate DPW as an agent and they could have the DPW go out and help them with inspections. So it gives them more flexibility so not everything is on Conservation Commission. Right. It helps to expand That's it. Right. 
Um, and one of the other things I want to mention too is just keep in mind, well first of all keep in mind that these are recommended bylaws, so it's ultimately up to the town and what you want, how you want the language to be. But the bylaws that we have prepared are based on templates that were developed by, I don't know if I remember the name of it, but I think it's the Northern Middlesex Stormwater Coalition and the Neponce River Stormwater Coalition. So they had developed uh, templates for these bylaws and those templates were basically blessed by both DP, DEP and EPA. Right. So it's bylaw language that they like and it's by adopting that language, then you're sure if EPA comes in again and takes a look at what you're doing, you can, you can be comfortable that the bylaw meets the requirements of what they want. It also ties in more directly to the permit requirements and they also have regulations that would be the next step to accompany the bylaw and those regulations and the bylaw are linked together. Again, template based. So it's you know it's you can be sure then you're meeting the requirements what you need to do. Right. And in the in, I mean I got the bylaw on the agenda so we're free to speak on all of that. See and I was talking about the bylaw. Sure. There's also a waiver provision that, that we inserted into the bylaw as well because we didn't have that before, right? Right. And that gives you the ability. For example, one of the concerns a number of towns have brought this up. One of the concerns is that you, know, you don't want to have keep piling permit requirements on onto residents or to developers or whoever. So again, because most of this bylaw is somewhat related to the Wetlands Protection Act and what the Conservation Commission is already doing, again, this is an example. If there is a project that's already going through conservation, they're filing a notice of intent, they're being issued in order conditions, they have inspection requirements, the town has the ability through that waiver process to issue a waiver to that developer or homeowner who, or whoever to say you don't have to apply for the stormwater permit because you're essentially already doing everything through conservation. Right. That way you're not applying twice, you're not sending permit fees in twice. Right. So it gets covered by that. So you right. have that ability no matter what, if if somewhere else that developer or resident or whoever is meeting the intent of the stormwater bylaw, you can issue a waiver from the bylaw. All right. Excellent. And one of the thing too is regulations, again I mentioned that briefly. So if this bylaw goes through and gets approved, then you'll need to establish regulations, which we have draft versions of those, which would be the next thing to do. Um, right now, the regulations, if we go that, if, if move forward with that, they go to conservation, they'd be reviewed and approved in theory at a public meeting with conservation. Then we add, had an added step in there, that approved, the approved regulations would then go to the select board. And the select board would also, at a public meeting, review and approve those. So there's two opportunities for the public to look at the regulations, to come to a public meeting and comment. You, you, <coughs> you do know, well I hope I know when I ask this question, they have, I believe the town has a set of regular stormwater regs on the books currently. Now I'm trying to remember, I get all the towns mixed up. I, don't I think I have a copy of it so I don't know if they're on the website. There's a lot of confusion yeah. about what's on our website. Is it current? We right. we, we got to work through those bugs. Yep. Um, with certain bylaws that are out there, there's been a lot of that rumor mill going on. But I have a mm -hmm. set of regulations. I believe I have that set. So if I do, I'll have my okay. administrative assistant scan it and send it to you. Okay. And just see if they're even, you know, applicable again uh, yeah. for that right now. Uh, I mean, and honestly, I would recommend if we go with the new bylaw, go with the new regulations because they're linked. So that way, they're referencing each other. You know, it, it's much cleaner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying, That's why if trying you, to adapt, you did the bylaw re kind of rewrite of the bylaw, then you could kind of keep the regs in line where it's not so stringent, where it's impossible to develop, right? right. And that's the problem is is we have a lot of land. We don't have a lot of land left that's uplands and buildable land, right? So the last thing we want to do is impede that development when we need certain development in the town. And we don't want to impede that by having such stringent regulations and bylaws I agree. where you're making people jump through hoops and spend fifty, hundred thousand dollars on stormwater. I mean, stormwater, controlling stormwater is extremely important, especially to abutters of land, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to be flooding people out. We had that problem with solar field, but we want to be <coughs> somewhat buildable friendly right mm -hmm. without making it so difficult for you know the average Joe to develop their lot and it's been in their family for the last hundred years and they might have 10 acres of land and they can knock off 
you know, for the kids or whatever they're getting through school and they want to build a kid a home site on their land. And we call it the family compound, right? Right. We don't want to make that impossible for a family to be able to do that for their kids, right? Agreed. So, and you know, you, you mentioned up, upland buildable land, and it's a, it's important. To, that's an important point because really where this bylaw fits in, it's for anything that would be over forty thousand square feet, but is out of the purview of conservation. So that really limits for most towns where the bylaw applies, because you've got to have forty thousand square feet and not near wetlands. So there's not a lot of properties left that are like that. But yeah. this sort of fills that hole. Excellent. A um, couple other quick things. I know you guys are, have a lot to do tonight, so. Um, oh, as that much more. You, you, <laughs> you're good on time right now. <laughs> so some of the things that we're looking to do um, moving forward, again, there's a number of things that we want to keep plugging away with, but some of the things we want to focus on is this requirement to begin to evaluate our current street design, parking guidelines, and other local requirements that affect the creation of impervious cover. So essentially what we would do and what the, the permit requires is to take a look at all of the different boards and departments. A lot of it's focused on planning and zoning, but also the conservation, their, their, um, their bylaw, their regulations, and look at anything. That, the big push is to minimize the amount of impervious cover that gets built. So looking at how that's addressed in the different bylaws, making sure it makes sense and making sure there isn't contradictions in the different bylaws. So we go through and assess them all to get, make sure they're all consistent. Um, the other thing is part of that is take a look at low impact development requirements because this new bylaw and the new regulations would have requirements. EPA is requiring you to take a look at low impact development potential. So infiltrating stormwater, treating stormwater, things like that. Making sure that any other bylaws or regulations and departments also address that and again it's consistent. So it's really about just getting consistency through your bylaws. Mm -hmm. The good news is I don't think we have, you said conservation, I don't think other than the stormwater bylaw, we don't have a wetlands bylaw in the town of Lacushna. No, I think you just rely on the, the State Wetlands Protection Act. Correct. So but again, but again, for consistency, we'd want to make yep. sure it all makes sense. Yep, yep. Um, and then the last, the last of um, the MS4 requirements, good housekeeping and municipal operations. So that's looking at what the town does. So DPW, transfer station, you know, anything, any municipal operations. So some of the things that we're going to address again going forward, so these will be the next few months. Um, we have done an initial inspection of the DPW yard, um, but we need to pull together a pollution prevention plan for that facility. So we'll be pulling that together. I recognize that picture. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, can't see I know, that's a town <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, so we're working on developing the SWIP, um, developing an employee training program. And we've got a standard approach that we can give to the town. It's, it's typically DPW. You want to make sure the DPW crews or the highway department crews um, get regular training. I think it's every three months, but we make it simple, something that just gets tracked. And it's just regular stormwater type training. Right, right. It's a very short period of time, something quick for them to do. Um, and then we'll do quarterly inspections of the um, highway garage or the DPW yard and the transfer station. And did we do one more in here? Yeah, so those are the main things that we're going to look at now moving forward. So just more paperwork type stuff. We also have to review your stormwater management plan that was done, I think, by the former conservation agent back 2008, maybe. So that we need to re review that, make sure that's updated, review the illicit discharge detection elimination program plan that that was done back in the same time frame. So those are supposed to be reviewed annually. So we need to go through those and make sure those are up to date. There's no changes need to be made. So there's a number of paperwork things we need to address. So that's the stuff we're going to be focused on in the next couple of months. So when we, when we get through all of this, we'll just call it MS4 mm -hmm. stuff, right? Do we have to, like, every single year keep spending exorbitant amounts of money? Because I know that this is costly to do the initial studies and, and detections and all of that stuff but is this something that the townspeople will be on the hook for funding every year or is this something that you would be looking we would have to do every five years or is something that we would be doing every 10 years well it's this is going to be an ongoing permit so it's going to be on and it's federal epa permit so it, it's you know a law so it's, it's under the clean water act they're going to keep renewing it so as of right now this 2000 this this current version of the MS4 
became effective in 2017, so we're in year five now, and it's a five-year permit. So, to give you an example, that this, this whole program started in 2003, that permit should have ended in 2008. They just kept continuing annually until 2016, when the new permit came out. It's going to keep going, but the requirements, in theory, should begin to be reduced as you come into compliance with, like your mapping is done, you know, your outfall inspections are done. But there's always going to be, sure. they're considering stormwater to be utility, so there's going to be ongoing maintenance, basically, as you go. So, but some of the larger, larger budget items should begin to reduce. Now, EPA should be coming out with a new permit at some point. I don't know when that's going to be. I don't know what those requirements are going to be. Right. But, you know, stormwater quality is important, and that's what they're going to focus on. Mm -hmm. So, it'll be an ongoing thing, unfortunately. Like, EPA has recommended, you know, communities, again, look at stormwater as like utility. And they want, they're recommending communities set up enterprise funds to be able to, through, you know, taxing, you know, adding a tax, which most communities don't want to do, which I understand. No one wants another tax. But, you know, Cushion isn't, isn't a large town. You don't have a large storm drain system, which is good. So hopefully this is something that isn't going to be a large burden. Right, right. So I had a quick conversation with you I think Mr. Kelly we had a quick meeting a few weeks back mm -hmm. right and I asked you the question because of this insanity on the nitrogen septic systems and all of that stuff right so I then I asked you because it kind of makes sense that we have the Cushion River here and I asked you if we could go in where and I know you said you'll isolate it to where our outfalls go dump into the Cushion River because a lot of the outfalls yeah. are dumping into the Cushion River right we could do nitrogen load tests mm -hmm. so that we could actually monitor nitrogen in that river so that in, f in the future, if this all came to a head, yep. we would know where our nitrogen's going and whether it's increasing or decreasing, right? And try to figure out where that's coming from. We'd go up the river and, and do testing, right? And see the nitrogen. And you said it's relatively cheap to do that kind of testing. So I just wanted to throw that out while I have a full board. Sure, yeah, you know, that, that's something we could certainly do and it would help to give you a baseline. So now you'd know we'd have the same sampling points each time and come back and grab those samples from those locations at the same time. So you have that baseline. You know what your nitrogen numbers are. Right. So if you start to see a increase, you know there's a concern. You know, if they stay the same or decrease, then potentially you can say we really don't have a concern here. Well, it would just be nice to know now nitrogen levels down the river, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we can test pretty far up the river, yep. right? All the way to the, the Lake Street Ponds, actually. We can even go that far and test yep. the water, right? Yeah, we can totally and then we know, but if we, if we know that it's coming from the current, from the ocean, which we know we have waste treatment facilities dumping into, and the furthest one that we have in, on the Cushion F Haven town line is starting to rise, but all our other ones aren't, we'll know that, that we're not the contributors to that nitrogen, right? And that's basically what I'm trying to do is protect the town from that future liability, saying, well, we know it's not from us because all of these outfalls, this is the test level we did in 2024, and this is what they are now, but the heaviest load is coming from the Cushion F Haven line, which is probably from the current bringing the crap in from the ocean, right? Because the tide does push up and down this river. Sure. No, you can certainly do that. We so can help. We can. We can help you do that. What do you think? Love it. Sure. I think it's a great idea. I just want to remind the board that this board created an MS4 stabilization fund and has been putting some free cash in just to make sure that uh, it doesn't hit the taxpayers as a tax. That. This board has been thinking of that all along, and that helps fund our effort in the MS4. Yeah. So, Mr. Working well. If you could put that into your plan, I think the board Absolutely. likes the idea, and this, mm -hmm. this, it, you know, it, it protects us. I think it's it's a good protection. It's an inexpensive protection down the road for us to look at. And if DEP or EPA is saying, "Well, look at this and look at that," and you know, blah, 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 with nitrogen loads and, you know, the coalition and all those people down there, we can say, well, wait a minute, we've done that test and we've been doing that testing for years and the nitrogen loads aren't exceeding anywhere down the river until you get to the Cushion at Haven line. So obviously we know there's a problem from current pushing that nitrogen into our waterways now, right? Yeah, it'd be nice to have that in your back pocket. 
Just That's what I want. I want dry gunpowder, right? <laughs> so I think it's important to help the community and the people of our community, right? Sure. So Makes sense. we can put that on the... Yep, we can put that in. Sound good, Tucker? Absolutely. All right. He's doing sample stuff. <laughs> so, right, right. I mean, you know, nobody wants, most people look at this and say, well, I don't want to spend money on that stuff, right? It's kind of like anybody coming into town and now you have the stormwater bylaw, right? Right. Costs a little bit of money to do it, but who wants to be flooded out by somebody else's project? Exactly. And that's happening. And you know, right before our eyes in this town right now. Yep. Right? <clears throat> no. One other thing I wanted to throw at you, the springing up solar fields is, we've had some flooding problems with a couple of them. I don't need to go into names on TV. Um, I think everybody at home that's gonna watch, they know what, I, what the board's talking about. It, I'm dumbfounded by the process of basins on solar fields, large solar fields, right? Ground uh, mounted solar fields. We have a special bylaw that goes that's just kind of nails large scale photovoltaic solar panels, right? It's a special bylaw. We just amended a bylaw um, for that reason. The basins, I've been out to the site several times, the one that's flooding. Mm -hmm. The basins, it, it appears to me that basins were, were dug out for the stormwater to hold, and it's only supposed to hold, I think, what is it, 72 hours? Of 72 hours. Yeah. Something like that, 72 hours, and it should drain, right? We don't allow wet basins, blah, 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 blah. It appears that when they, you know, the rocket scientists that designed that stormwater basin, they never look for groundwater. And what it, what it tells me is if that basin's filling up, they, they do all the models and calculations on a computer and say, based on the ground surface, the tilt of the topography, blah, 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 this is what size basin you need, right? Yeah. I'm assuming that's what they do. But I don't think what they're doing is calculating in like they do when they do a perk test, okay, where they, you have to find groundwater, right. right? And a perk test, I think the Board of Health's got a regulation or it's just a standard rule that applies for them. I think it's four feet above groundwater for a septic system, right. and they can give a waiver to two feet above groundwater, depending right. on the circumstances, yeah, the hardship, right? Yep. Why wouldn't we have something in our st stormwater by a lot of basically says the same thing for large scale solar panels, solar fields, where they need to do, quote unquote, the per test, know where groundwater is, and then they were, would be required, if, if, if prior to any construction, that that basin needs to sit so many feet above mm -hmm. groundwater. Because when I go out to the one that's flooding out everybody right now, and there's probably other ones that are gonna be flooding out and it's going into the woods so nobody's knowing, but right now we have actual residents being impacted by flooding. You can't build a basin on top of groundwater, right? Because the water, the, the storm water's got nowhere to infiltrate, right? There's gotta be that buffer right. for infiltration. So water, if you take water and you pour it on top of water, it sits on top of itself, mm -hmm. right? So if you build a basin and you dig down, six feet into the ground, but groundwater's at six and a half feet, you only have a six inch infiltration for all that groundwater that's filling that basin to infiltrate and then you're on top of groundwater. Hence, flooding. Yep. So it just got me to thinking because it's so aggravating to watch all this crap go on in my town and it's, it seems like, oh, peer review, have engineers, yeah, let me do calculations. But that engineer's doing the same kind of calculations as the first engineer, might tweak a few things and go, Yep, I made my five grand on my peer review, but it's everything's good to go. But then we got a solar field that's flooding out our residents. Which so standard engineering practice would be just like you said, even for you know similar to the board of health requirements, the Title Five requirements, you do need to have separation to groundwater. So standard engineering practice would be you know, a minimum of four feet of separation, even for a, a detention or a retention basin, because you do need that space of soil to be able to infiltrate. You need that that clear space for the water is a place to go essentially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, long story short, they, that should be done anyways, but you could certainly add that into your bylaw just to make it very clear that this is a concern that the town has and we want to make sure that this is done. But it should be. You really shouldn't be designing an infiltration basin without doing a test fit to see what type of soils you have because you need to see how much is going to infiltrate as part of your calculations and where groundwater is. And it's not just where the groundwater is at that time, you need to look to see where it is during the high groundwater period. Because obviously in April, 
we have a lot more rain, groundwater elevations are higher. So it's gonna be completely different than what you're gonna see in July. Correct. So you could put in language in there to make sure that whoever is doing this design does meet those requirements. But it should be done anyways. Should be and has been, I can tell you right now, based on this board's experience, mm -hmm. it ain't happening. And that's something... I, I can tell you it's not, I mean, I, I got pictures of basins and people pumping from a basin up to a basin, from that basin discharging into the wetlands with pumps. So we know everything's failed. Right. Why did it fail? I don't know, maybe I'm not smart enough to figure that out, but it got me to thinking that the only reason why that basin's failing is because the water's got nowhere to infiltrate and it's sitting on top of groundwater. Common sense, right? Right, if that's the, if that's the case, if that's the condition out there, then that more than likely is what the problem is. So again, I'm looking to protect the residents of a Cushnet by having something governing that kind of a project. Sure. And that's something even you could add to the stormwater bylaw, but you'd want to keep it separate from the land disturbance, 40,000 square feet portion. Yeah, yeah you absolutely. You want to have that, that's, this is standard no matter what. So that could be its own little separate section. Yeah, it's own little, own little, just like in our regular bylaws. We have zoning bylaws and there's a separate section for large scale photovoltaic solar panels, right? Yeah. Tells you how you de can develop that area. Well, I, maybe we do that little section and yeah. pop it into a stormwater bylaw yeah. that it says about separation from groundwater. Yeah. So that we, we, we can, it's basically foolproof in the development, right? And, and right. they would have to do that before they can get any kind of approval from planning for a solar field. They'd have to do that testing first right. to make sure that their basins can be located where they're proposing to planning board to put those basins. And they have to submit that to planning and say, here's the proof that everything, this is where groundwater is. We're only going down X. That's why the, the tension, the basin's being built this way, right? Yeah. And at this depth. Yeah, if you're running into that problem in town, then it would be something good to address formally so that you don't have that as an ongoing problem. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Anything that protects the residents of this yeah. town. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can capture something small sure. and, and to keep it, like you said, Kev, away from everything else, we don't want people building little house lots that are now required to dig these little basins for storm water, and, you know, roof runoff and the post-construction, pre-construction, blah, blah language that's in this bylaw, right? You gotta manage it. You can't have, you can't exceed your post-construction from your pre-construction stormwater runoff. That's basically yeah. what the, the stormwater bylaw does, right? Yeah. You have to control that on your property. Right. Okay. We don't wanna be, you know, again, making it tougher for people to develop a single house lot or two house lots on a family compound, yeah. but we want it to be put in there for a large scale photovoltaic field, solar fields. Yeah, we can put that in there. And basically, just telling people essentially it's going to, it, it would be you need to follow engineering practice, standard engineering practice. This is, these are the things that you need to do. But you, I want that word, you know, the groundwater thing. That's going to all be in there and identify it so that nobody, they can't play dummy to dunce. Yeah, Saying, you know, making an argument of that's not really what that says. So let's not make that out to it. And it's like, yeah, it does say that. It's right there in black and yeah. white. And yeah, we can make it very clear. And we can propose language and you know, have the board take a look at it and make sure it makes sense. That's what you want. Anything else? I think that's it, right? Is that the end? Yeah. That's the end. All right. Well, thank you for everything you're doing for the town of a Thanks for having us in. I appreciate thank you coming you very in. Much. You're welcome. I don't know, Mr. Kelly, we. Can we send, I, I, you know you said you sent the bylaw to planning chairman, board of health chairman and conservation chairman? So I guess we. A meeting with conservation chairman tomorrow. We can discuss this too. Kev, how quick can you get us that little thing governing the, the solo large scale? I can get you a draft by the end of the week. Could you? Because we, we yeah. Mr. I'll Kelly's got to arrange it with, for planning board to do for the stormwater bylaw, okay. a public hearing. Okay. So they have some 
uh, 14 day notice or something, you know. I'll talk something. to uh, Mark tomorrow. So I, I, I'd like to get the, I want the bylaw to go through the process, right? Through yep. planning, public hearing, and everything else. And conservation will probably take it up for discussion as well. But I'd like it to be able to sit out on the website for 30 days prior to town meeting so that everybody can review it and understand what it is. You know, I we talked about it before. We don't want people thinking that we're jamming something down the townspeople's throat, right? right. So if we can get it to public hearing, conservation can do a meeting to vet it out. I'm, I'm sure that the planning board's going to do their public hearing. That'll, I'm sure some conservation members will go, so maybe conservation won't do that. But at least it'll have its vetting process and ample time to sit on the website for everybody to know this is coming up at we make a section for on our website about town meeting, right? Some of the articles, the warrant, whatever we get finalized, the bylaws, anything bylaw related, I can post minimum 30 days prior to town meeting. So town we get it. But I need you to get that clause and just slam dunk it somewhere in here. Yeah, the, well, the letter has a separate article. So we have another article. Or yeah, but into the bylaw, right? Yeah. So you can take it, just submit it. Yep. Maybe you highlight it and yellow us so everybody knows that's a, a whole new addition. Yeah, I've got the, the way of the bylaw now. We have some of those things I mentioned are highlighted to consider. So we'll do the same with that one. We'll just make that whole article, new article. So. Thank you very much. Thank Welcome. You. Appreciate it. Thanks, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. So going back to do business, Mendel Road potholes. I know DPW's office got phone calls, Selectman's office got phone calls. Um, I returned a couple of those phone calls to the residents with issues of Mendel Road. Um, I was actually driving the road when I spoke to the residents. Um, totally get their concerns, um, safety issues on that road. Um, some of the things that were described to me is just couldn't even fathom of what's taking place on that road because of people speeding and you know the parents are traveling back and forth to pick up kids and back and forth from school so I was on the road is a good stretch of that road probably at least a quarter mile of that road that's just banged up hard but it comes it's from where the fire tower is and all that land that's up there and that storm water's coming off and it's been an icing condition for decades in the winter time because all that water runs off that field from where the fire tower is and things of the like and that's what's eroding the road mm -hmm. so mr menards had a lot of has a lot of materials um at the dbw barn i know he's been doing some other work in pope park um and down at the golf course right now i had a conversation with him because trying to get out there with a we, we got like a hot box that attaches to the back of a truck where they fill it up with cold patch stuff that's garbage. I've seen them go down, put that stuff in potholes through the winter months. Within a week, the crap's already out of the road, right? The, the, the asphalt's too hot, it's too cold, it can't, it doesn't sit, man. It just gets punctured right out. So I asked Mr. Menard, he's gonna be getting, uh, asphalt should be available next week, two weeks. I said, if you're gonna be doing some um, path work with the asphalt machine at the golf course that's not too far away from Mendel Road. I said, wouldn't it be easier to take that machine and just do a quick overlay over that busted up road instead of going over there with your little stamp of thing and popping out in a week? And he said, yeah, that would probably be the best bet. But he's got all drainage equipment to go out and do it basically from that fire tower that I just spoke of all the way down to Garrison Lane. Mm -hmm. He's got all the equipment, piping and, and basins to do that work. Um, he just hasn't gone out there to do it yet. We've already done from Garrison down to the high tension lines with new storm water controls down there. Yep. So now it's from the fire tower area where that curved land is and the farms are down to Garrison to tie into that and all go. Yeah, that section is completely covered in ice and water. All winter it's ice, all summer it's wet. Yeah, I know you travel that road a lot. It's just, it, it's a complete nightmare. The road needs to be milled and paved. Yeah. I told Dan, I said, we're not sending the hot box guy out there. You know, the, one of our DPW guys, you see him out there with the hot box. And it's, that's just garbage. It's a waste of money. And those people are just going to be aggravated in two weeks. So if he can get out there, I'd actually entertain a motion to have Mr. Menard 
overlay Mendel Road in that busted up section um, within the next two weeks by April 15th or whatever to so solve, yeah. solve that problem. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So that'll take care of that for the residents. That little, that little hip curve that that's where yeah, yeah. So you can tell that that a lot of the patches were there i mean he's going to go out there and work on the side of the road and bust up a lot of it anyway so like i, I told a couple of residents that i spoke to on the phone i said well the board will act, um, take action immediately to fix that problem um immediately meaning a couple of weeks it's going to take for us to do it um, but we're going to get mr menard out there but right now the water table is so high he's just going to be yeah. digging and Correct. water is just going to be pouring out of the ground so with that said, just have them overlay it real quick. It's, it's just a quick patch job, but it, it makes it nice and clean and even. Yep. He'll go out there, dig up the road, and then this board's gonna have to figure out what, you know, an allocation of funds to do the road. Yep. The yep. problem is, is the road right from Perry Hill Road, where Mendel starts, all the way down to the Four Corners where Hathaway Road is, it's like a half a mile of road. Mm -hmm. It's a long, long distance. So I'm not saying we have to do that whole stretch, but there's some really crappy parts from Perry Hill till you hit that like 114 number, I think it is on an address, all the way down to like 215 or something I measured. I forget the exact houses, but it's it's a long stretch of road. Yep. So we'll have to figure out chapter 90 funds and what we're gonna do with that project, Mr. Kelly. Do you want it within two weeks from today or within two weeks from when the asphalt plants open? I think we said by April 15th. Same day your taxes are due. April 16th? 17th. Oh, it's 17th, <laughs> whatever. But whatever whatever we need to do, somewhere around there so it just doesn't get forgotten about. And if they're gonna have the paving machine, you know, in the next two weeks where they're gonna have it, move that, get out there where they trailer it up, get it up there, it's right around the corner. They can drop it and spread that in probably two or three hours just to make it better for those folks. And then we'll figure out a long-term plan. Town meeting articles. Mr. Kelly, you want me to buzz through this real quick because it's pretty simple, right? It's basically all housekeeping stuff. Correct. Uh, a couple the, of uh, the COA, uh, uh, the CATV article, we've got to finalize the figures. That's why they're in red, but it's a standard article. But most of the others are either articles that are housekeeping or placeholders. That's correct, and we usually set that up when, later on that we when we do the omnibus budget. We just set it up so that we bundle up a bunch of the articles with the moderator, right? All, right. These, hou all these housekeeping ones. It's just Mickey Mouse stuff. I, I just wanted to put it in front of you so you know where we're going, and mm -hmm. you. If there are any questions on any of the housekeeping articles, uh, you can get them to me individually, and uh, I can, uh, if there's any research that needs to be done, give it to the board. Do you have anything I'd ask the board to, to look into? I we'll have some discussion with Mr. Kelly is Article 16. It's only paying eight bucks an hour for our senior work off program. Um, I think that, that could go to ten bucks. That, just saying. Remember, that's not a paycheck. It's. I, I know it's a, for the tax deferral. So I, get it. I have no uh, no horse in the race, but it's. Uh, the, the the youth program we're paying fifteen bucks up to four thousand dollars I think per kid, mm -hmm. right? And then the senior program we're paying eight bucks an hour. All I'm asking is if the board wants to consider moving eight to ten. That's all. It, and uh, just a just a suggestion for me. I can draft that article that way if the, it's a consensus of the board to do that. It's just changing one number. I just drafted it for you. <laughs> <laughs> if the board so chooses to yeah. change that from eight to ten bucks, yeah. that's that's it. It still has a, it still has a max. Still has a max yeah, of fifteen hundred bucks, right? Yeah. Two bucks an hour ain't gonna kill us. And um, I, we've I, been we've been very fortunate that we've had several seniors come and work mm -hmm. on that program for us whether it be filling vacancies in offices while people are on vacation things of the like it's still nice to have somebody 
in that office to answer that phone. So yep. thank you to our seniors that have worked in this program. It's very much appreciated from the Board of Selectmen. Um, I think it's done some great great things for the town and great things for our seniors. So, you know, I, I think this board, uh, the support of that and the support of the YES program for the youth, not only is it super beneficial for the town, but it's been beneficial for all of the participants. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, are programs that are starting to be mirrored in other towns in the area when they see our successes. So it's uh, it compliments to the board for putting those programs into existence. It's always easy to be a follow-up, but it's much more successful to be a leader, right? Yeah. And that's what we're, we're trying to do is lead, not fall. So, I, I don't, generally, you don't have, if you've gone through it, there's not much here. I mean, like I said, it's, it's just housekeeping stuff. Mr. Kelly's plugged in a few different things. There is some funding for our fire department for the relocation of the repeat of things and things of the like, but there's a little breakdown of free cash at the top. It's basically uh, health insurance, the school bus litigation thing, fire department, senior tax write-off program, youth program, and then 100 for stabilization if we so choose. That's the, but there ain't much else in here other than house cleaning things to this point. I know we'll be adding some articles. CPC limits are the standard limits you do each year. Correct. I see Paul is the only one that actually shot something this year. Yeah, well, actually, uh, the CPC is just uh, met, and there are going to be some uh, park recreation. I know. I didn't notice. I did talk to you about um, Chad from the park. Yep. But when I looked at that, I'm like, oh, boy, we're missing something. But I'm sure it'll be a yep. change. So we'll have that discussion. I'll find and and uh, I'm also uh, investigating whether... Uh, trying to get some prices on moving the monuments in front of the old li uh, Russell Library to a location uh, by Parting Way. So when you sell the library, we can have already moved the monuments. And Mr. Gasper can use his metal detector to find <laughs> the time, time capsule. Time capsule. Time capsule. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna do that. Well, that's coming out of the ground. <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. We'll, we're gonna get it out of the ground. That's for sure. But yeah, we, we definitely need to look at a plan to move the monuments over here. And, and you know, obviously, you got to put that on a cement footing, you know, yep. so they're not falling over. Mm -hmm. So we'll figure out. Some, there's one that's kind of hidden in the bushes over here, so yeah. we might have to do a little bit of reconfiguration of the grounds and just make it a nice little monumental site, right, and put them all in a... Yeah, we're going to get a the a pricing on that. I think Kind of like we do with the Veterans Memorial, you know, it's got a little arch to it, yep. and maybe you just do the same kind of concept, but just keep it all greenery, right? Yep. We don't do the bricks and patios and all of that stuff, just do a nice little footing and you can rest all the yep. monuments on that and they'll have a permanent place with some nice shrubbery around it. It's interesting, we've had a couple requests for people to get married in the gazebo too. Mm -hmm. So it's turning into, it could turn into a nice little park. Yep, the um, the fees for that though, it's crazy. The fees we have for the gazebo, if you want to rent it, it's big bucks. These are just like pictures. 25 bucks or something? <laughs> we don't even have a fee. I'm just seeing what he's going to say. He's like, wait a minute, we got fees for that? I'm going to find that fee schedule. <laughs> That's no, more fun. Don't. They don't pay. I was just seeing the road. I was just seeing what he was going to, how he's going to react to that. But And the other thing, you know, talking about the potting ways grounds, um, we really need to look at finishing up the we still have some money left over in an old article for the rehab of that potty waste building that left side of the building is the last side that we need to do the siding on we have to try to figure out as a board collectively how we're going to get that other side finished up yeah, well, it's i'm not comfortable with the with the current staffing levels we have i think maybe we're going to have to talk to some you know contractors and see if there's yeah well we got to talk about that side too okay boss I can tell by that face we'll do that off air. <laughs> <laughs>
So that's that, but it'd be nice to actually finish the pounding ways, build in right, pressure wash the gazebo thing and all that if we move the monuments and do some nice greenery. I, I would. We still have a beautification committee? Yes. Yeah. Maybe we, we should punt that project to beautification. Yeah. Well, uh, next time that they do a meeting, maybe we ought to put something tomorrow. on there. Tomorrow. Is Nancy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're having a meeting tomorrow? Yes. The problem with that, their agenda's already set and it's not on their agenda, so I can't do that. So it'll be a violation. Oh, no, I'm just letting you know they're meeting tomorrow. That's their next meeting. Right. So their next, next meeting. Okay. The uh, parting way, uh, I encourage anybody who hasn't gone over and seen how the old sign was restored That's by right. our staff yeah. to go over and look at it. Yep. David, the maintenance guy, he did it inside of our little garage over there. Did a great um, job. Yep. With a couple of the OC kids. Yep. yep, yep, yep. The help they did and the way they put that thing back together, it's pretty incredible. And it's inside the building now, so if anybody at home wants to go in and take a look at it, you got to go inside the Pounding Waste building, and it's on the wall. To preserve it. Correct. Yes. All right. So uh, execute MOA town plans. Uh, that's st we're still waiting for it to come back signed from Mattapoisa. Interim town account. Uh, uh, Judy has been on site the last two days. Uh, there are going to be meetings between her and uh, Jen, the treasurer collector and Angela to go over some items mm -hmm. and uh, I think we're getting to the point where now uh, we've got a stop gap situation again but a situation where we can be confident all the financial uh, mm. T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Yeah, unfortunate with those last few folks that we've brought in so I don't know if you've both met Judith I'm not yet. very nice young lady um, hopefully we'll be keeping her on board for a while I know she's already seen some things that she wants to put a corrective action in place so you know it's funny every time you bring somebody new in with that kind of level of experience it's they pick up on something yep. and they're like, you know what? I think there's a better way to, you know, build that mouse trap. So, it'll be interesting to see what she comes up with next. So, all right, town administrator's report. I think I covered everything else on the agenda. Mr. Kelly, you have anything? Uh, I went to a meeting with <coughs> Mega yesterday, our uh, workers' comp insurer, and. Uh, they have a grant program where the town can apply for $5,000 every year to create, a cr uh, to correct a, an issue that uh, would affect the safety of our employees. Uh, in advance of doing that, I've requested that they do a safety audit of both school buildings, the DPW, the police station and the library and that we look to see if there are any issues in those buildings. They have already done uh, a walkthrough uh, here and they'll update their walkthrough as far as the safety audits of the buildings right here and just to remind the board it's from the, that grant that we were able to get the additional AEDs. Okay. Excellent. <coughs> Selectman announcements. Gentlemen, Mr. Wona, anything? No. Nope. Mr. Hinkley, anything? Uh, just real quick, um, a couple of the uh, Boy Scouts reached out. They are, there's three young men that are obtaining the rank of Eagle Scout mid-April, um, and they asked us to attend. Obviously, we can't all attend. Um, if it's all right with you guys, I'd like to do it. Um, I had already put together two citations for two of them, and I have to work on another one. Um, but I also got a personal invitation from one of the gentlemen there who actually interviewed me for it. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to uh, attend that on yeah. behalf of the board. Actually, I seen 100 percent, right? and I appreciate you volunteering for that because I seen the date, mm -hmm. and I won't be in town. So thank you very much for Absolutely. volunteering for um, that commitment. Mm -hmm. 
it's going to be nice to see three three young men get the rank of the Eagle Scout in one shot. And um, I already let Rep Spin know, and he's excited because he's a former Eagle Scout. Well, sure is. You're not a former Eagle Scout. You're always an Eagle yeah, Scout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's pretty excited to participate as well. So Excellent. just like he's a Marine. Yes, correct. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I haven't done my selectman announcement, but no, I just something th so it doesn't fall between the cracks. As you know, last week we discussed, or last meeting we discussed that a letter came from Fairhaven asking for some, and it had been on previous agendas, regional uh, cooperation. This board had talked about and appointed Selectman Wona to uh, represent the board with the selectman representative from Fairhaven, uh, if I'm correct. There was discussion about it. I the think we I, need a vote. The only one I know is we did the, talked about some regionalization with Rochester Fairhaven for dispatch of those Hinkley. Yeah, but, uh, but if he wants to do that, the yellow, because I read the letter, you gave me that letter that the Fairhaven town administrator submitted to talk about, you know, collaborating on other positions and things Multiple. of the like with regionalization if Selectman Wona wants to play that role. Glad, glad to do it. Last year I had spoken with, you may recall, with Scotia Powers, who was the chair at the time, and we had talked about doing something like that, but we never got around to it. So yep. It, I, yep. that's a great project. And I know Beach Pass is a number one. So I was just going to say it. I was going to say it. Good man. Okay. So Mr. Wona has volunteered his time and efforts to its... Um, you know other positions and exploring that if you could mr wanna conservation agent is so important yeah. so if you can get with jamie and stuff like a punch list of things that you want to address conservation agent i mean we the, the chairman's going bonkers with calls and like i was we just discussed <laughs> what i don't have us for flooding issues and things of, flooding yeah. issues and things of the like i mean you know he's a working man you know we have a secretary in, in the office doing things um she just doesn't have all that experience to do the job so i think that you know right. conservation agent i'm sure they have one let's figure that out and see if we can get some help in our town and uh selectman hinkley triggered something in my mind i had a discussion with uh representative schmidt to reinforce what you talked to him about and he's going to try to get an earmark in the state budget for the sidewalks and handicapped ramps on Slocum Street. Okay, excellent. Guess we're going to have to have that conversation. We're releasing that money from the transportation bond bill because right? yeah. I know that Mr. Strauss and Mr. Schmidt are not um, running for re-election, which was I was really caught off guard by that announcement from especially from rep strauss i was kind of like wow it's interesting there's i think tw up to 20 senior legislators that are not running i think we we should try to get them in to have that discussion because i know that money's been sitting out there since like 2015. do you want me to schedule soon yeah, I think I think the sooner the better, right? We can get them in here to have a quick conversation with them, thank them for their efforts um, thus far in the town, and I think that's very important that we get that release. Um, he's the chairman of the transportation. transportation yeah. Yeah. So while we have them working on our behalf, I think we need to capitalize. All right. Is there, uh, my only selectman's announcement is always to the, the residents of the town of Cushnet, happy Easter, be safe. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye.